Hello folks, welcome to the Edupedia world and I am Abhinay Gupta. Today again we'll continue with the topic the Sarfasi Act 2002, which is the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of the Security Interest Act 2002. So we'll have a quick brief review of what we have done so far in our previous lectures. We have seen the entire flow with the four components, the obligor, oblig, uh, the originator, securitization and reconstruction company and the QIB. Right, the relationship between each of them and then we have seen the various definitions and we know that the definitions are asked in the examination from this particular chapter and we have done some basic definitions in detail the non-performing assets, the financial asset, securitization, reconstruction, obligor, originator, security receipt, scheme and stuff right then we have seen section 3 where we talked about the registration of the securitization and reconstruction company and the issue of the certificate of registration then we had seen section 4 where we talked about the cancellation of the certificate of registration and what are the grounds on which that certificate is being cancelled then we had also seen section 5 that talked about the acquisition of the right right into the financial asset where the securitization and reconstruction company acquires the financial asset from the bank or the originator Right? Then we have also seen section 6 where we understood that it is the responsibility of the bank to send a notice to the obligor, other concerned person and to the registering authority right? to inform them about the acquisition of the financial asset by the securitization and reconstruction company. Right? And even if after that the obligor comes to the bank with the money, the bank will hold it in trust for the securitization and reconstruction company. Right? Then we have also seen section 7 where we have seen that the securitization and reconstruction company issues the security receipt to the qualified institutional buyers against which the qualified institutional buyers give them the fund and that fund is kept in a separate bank account by the securitization and the reconstruction company. Right. So that is all that we have covered so far. Right, And I hope all those topics are very clear with you. If there is any query, please go back to the previous lecture, complete it and then we'll move ahead with the lecture. Right, So let's start the current topic that we'll be discussing today. Today we'll discuss about section 8, section 9, section 10 and section 13. So first we'll talk about section 8. So what has section 8 got to say? So as per section 8, the security receipt that the uh, securitization and reconstruction company issues to the qualified institutional buyers, that security receipt which is in pursuant to the scheme need not be registered. Right? So the registration of that security receipt is not important. This is what section 8 has to say. Followed by that we have section 9 which talks about the various measures for the asset reconstruction. The measures that are available with the securitization and reconstruction company with the help of which they can get the asset, the financial asset reconstructed. Right? The first thing is that they can change or take over the management of the company, of the obligor. So when they change the management or when they take over the management of the borrower, of the obligor, what happens is they can now guide, guide and direct the company as per their own need so that they are able to recover the amount that they are ought to get. Right? Because then they will, uh, they will take the company into the direction the company would function for the sole purpose of recovering their debt right and once that is done done the management will be re uh, positioned the management of the borrower will be repositioned they will be given their space again and and the securitization and reconstruction company also has the right and the power to sell or lease the whole or part of the business of the borrower right so in order to recover their debt Right? They can take over the management, they can take over the business and sell it off so that their money is recovered. Right? If needed, they can sell off the entire business if it's a huge loan and for any nominal amount, like if the, uh, a part of business can be sold and that amount can be gathered, then they'll just sell the part of the business. Right? And then they can also take a step ahead for rescheduling the debts, the debts of the borrower. Right? So they can re, uh, reschedule the repayment by the borrower, right? So if the borrower is supposed to repay any other debt, they can get it rescheduled and they and their debt would be the priority. 
So if borrower has some money, so they'll make sure that that money is received by the securitization and reconstruction company against the debt that they have with the borrower, right? So they have the power to reschedule the other debts, right? And then they can, they also have the right to enforce the security interest. Now enforcement of security interest is a detailed topic and we'll cover it in detail actually in section 13, when we cover section 13. So in section 9, we'll just understand that yeah, enforcement of security interest is also a measure available with the securitization and reconstruction company for uh, uh, reconstructing their asset, right? Then settlement of the dues payable by the borrower. They also have the power to settle away the dues that the borrower is supposed to pay to somebody else, right? And now the borrower will pay them the money so that the borrower actually they want to bring the borrower into a position to give them the money, right? And then the securitization and reconstruction company, if the above measures are not useful, if they're not able to reconstruct the asset, then they will physically take away the uh, position in the secured asset and then they can sell it off and get the money back. Whatever is the asset that the borrower has given as security, that will be uh, that will be confiscated actually by the securitization and reconstruction company. They will take the position of that particular asset. And finally, if these do not work, then what can they do is they can take the shares of the company in, in return in exchange of the debt, right? So they, ha they have the power to convert any portion of the debt into shares of the borrower company, right? So these are the various measures which help the securitization and reconstruction company to reconstruct their financial asset. Right. So that was all about section nine. We move on to the next section, which is section 10. Right. Now here we will learn about the other functions of the securitization and reconstruction company. So other than securing the asset from the bank and reconstructing that asset to gain the money, what other functions does the securitization and reconstruction company have? So if we look at it from a bird eye view, what we see is that they can act as an agent of the bank. Now, why do a bank need an agent, right? So as per their own nature, the securitization and the reconstruction company can be an agent of a bank or any financial institution, right? For the purpose of recovering their dues, the dues of the bank, right? From the borrower. And in exchange, they'll take some fees or some commission from the bank, right? And that fee or commission will be mutually agreed between the bank and the securitization company, right? So as an agent means, if the bank is not able to get their debt out from any person. So instead of giving it away to securitization company, like we have seen the basic function of securitization, instead of getting that asset securitized, the bank can also hire the securitization and reconstruction company as an agent who will help the bank to get that money out from the borrower. And in return, bank will pay them some fees, right? Then they can also act as a manager of the secured asset. So when we'll uh, read about section 13, where we'll see the enforcement of security interest, there we'll see that the securitization and reconstruction company can take over the financial asset, right? And then appoint a manager to take care of the financial asset and then make the basic decisions of what is to be done with the financial asset. So they can also hire a securitization company as a manager for the same, right? So they can also act as a manager for that particular purpose, right? And then they can also act as a receiver for the obligor. Now, who is a receiver? Receiver basically is a person who manages the company for a short time, right? That is basically to recover the dues or to pay to the creditors. So in this case, they can act as a receiver and they will only be appointed by any court or tribunal, right? And there's one more important thing that any securitization or reconstruction company is not allowed to commence or carry on any other business, right? Unless and until it is uh, approved by uh, RBI on a prior basis, right? So it is a strict bar unless and until RBI approves them. And if by, by the time they are being converted into a securitization and reconstruction company, if they are already into a business, then they will have to seize that business within a period of one year from the commencement of the act, right? So if they're carrying on any other business because there was no act for the enforcement of the same and there were no restrictions, so they were, they may have been carrying on any business in the past, but once the act, the securitization and reconstruction of security interest of financial asset and the enforcement of security interest act 2002 came into force, 
after that within the period of one year they will have to curtail all their business operations right they'll have to curb them actually they'll have to close it they'll have to seize the business within a period of one year from the commencement of the act so this is what section 10 has got to say right these are the some basic other functions of the securitization company it is a very light section now we move on to one of the very important section of the chapter that is section 13 the enforcement of security interest and you have recently been asked a question on the same in your November 2011 examination so first and foremost thing that we have already discussed and we need to understand is that when the securitization and reconstruction company goes ahead to get its asset reconstructed no court has the right to intervene right so section 13 also has the very first basic point to discuss that is that no intervention of any court will take place while the securitization and reconstruction company goes ahead to reconstruct a financial asset so in the very beginning there is a relationship of uh, originator and the obligor right the secured creditor and the secured debtor so by the time or till the time they are making the payments the repayment of the debt the installments principal plus interest and everything till they are being done with frequent intervals and at their due time it is a performing asset but when it stops right it becomes a non-performing asset when the borrower defaults right then they become a non-performing asset and this time when they become a non-performing asset the secured creditor would send a notice right to the borrower that yes you have become a non-performing asset please discharge all your liabilities within the period of next 60 days Right. So that is what the borrower is supposed to do. Once they receive a notice from the secured creditor, they will have to discharge all their liabilities, the uh, amount that is pending, within the period of next 60 days. Right? And the notice that the secured creditor sends to the borrower will contain the details of the secured asset right? and also the amount which is payable from the, by the borrower. Right? So entire detail is given in the notice and then it is then the borrower is asked to discharge the obligation in the next 60 days. Right? And if the borrower is not in a position to discharge the liability, the borrower can make representation. Right? After it has received the notice only, they will make the representation. And if the representation is accepted by the secured creditor, then there is no problem they'll go as per the representation that they have made and then they'll decide as to how the procedure has to be taken forward but if it is not acceptable by the secured creditor then they will have to communicate it back to the borrower within one week that okay we do not accept your representation please discharge all your liabilities in the next 60 days right and when the borrowers uh, when the borrowers this representation is neglected when it is rejected the borrower has the right to approach the debt recovery tribunal for this case right but if uh, they have informed the borrower uh, very clearly that yeah this is the reason why we uh, reject your representation and if everything is communicated and everything is keep kept very transparent for the borrower then the borrower is not allowed to appeal to the debt recovery tribunal right then there will be no intervention of the debt recovery tribunal right so this is the start of the security enforcement act uh, security uh, the enforcement of security interest right we have seen that the court cannot intervene and what happens when does the enforcement of security interest begin right so this is the crux this is when it starts now what happens in the entire procedure will be covered in the next lecture right so stay tuned until then this is abhinay gupta signing off thank you bye bye